Amen. James chapter 4. We're going to be focusing especially on the first part of the chapter as we talk about a subject that is probably on most of your minds this morning, um, and that is the subject of war. Um, there's a lot going on in the world right now, especially with the situation with Russia and the Ukraine, where a lot of people, I know myself, have been focusing on this idea of war, you know, what this could mean um, for us, for our country. I was a little surprised yesterday, um, you know, at kind of the, the, uh, the pulse of America. We went out so morning yesterday, and like there's a lot of people that just really don't know or care about what's going on, but I guess that's uh, just more of the spiritual state of our country in general. But anyway, it has been on my mind and I know on your mind. So I want to look at um, a study this morning on what the Bible talks about of war. It seems very confusing at times. There's information everywhere. There's different perspectives on things. I've done my best to keep you know, my personal opinion um, on certain situations out of this sermon because the bottom line is that we may all have different um, you know, takes on certain situations. I'm also going to explain why that is. It's not because of the Bible. It's because of, you know, um, the man factor, the information factor that is out there. So, but I want to give you this morning just a biblical perspective on the subject of war, because hopefully I can take this complicated subject for you this morning and make it simple for you. So at least we can all have a proper biblical perspective on this topic then that, that perspective from the Bible can be applied to every situation. That's how we should look at um, the Bible. So Exodus chapter 15, I'll just read for you verse number 3. The Bible does say the Lord is a man of war, and the Lord is his name. So war is a reality even for the Lord. In Matthew chapter 24 and verse number 6, you turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. In Matthew chapter 24 and verse number 6, the Bible says that war is going to be something that we deal with, that we see. And as we get closer to the end times, we will see more and more of this. In verse number 6 of Matthew 24, the Bible says, And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things much come to pass but the end is not yet. So as we get closer to the end times, and look, I don't know when the end times are going to be, but these are clues for us. We're going to be starting a new end times series in a couple of weeks called Clues and Milestones. Wars are clues. Wars are clues. The Bible is telling us in Matthew 24 that as the end approaches, and look, tomorrow will be closer to the end of, of the world than today is, no matter when that happens. So the Bible says that wars will be more and more and as the time approaches the end. Now look down at Ecclesiastes chapter 3. The Bible also says that there is a time for war. The purpose this morning is to look at war in general from a biblical perspective and try to get an idea of what is a just war according to the Bible and what is not a just war according to the Bible. And the Bible does give us this answer. Look down at Ecclesiastes chapter 3, and let's just look at what the Bible says about time. Look at verse number 1. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, a very famous passage in the Bible here. It says, to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. So for everything there's a season. Then it goes into this large list. Verse number 2, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to get and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to rent, that means to tear. And a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A lot of these that I've just read could apply or have something to do with war itself. Now look at verse number nine, or verse number eight, I'm sorry. A time to love and a time to hate. And the Bible actually specifically calls out war, and it says that there is a time of war and a time of peace. The Bible here is literally saying that there is a time for war. And that's what we're going to look at this morning. What is a biblical time 
for war in the Bible. What is that time? Under what circumstances? Under what circumstances is it okay? Is it just, is it biblical for a nation to go to war against another nation? Because we're talking about nations here. We're not talking about individuals. So remember that when you think about war, war is about nations. War is about nations against nations. So that's what we're going to look at this morning. Look at a simple biblical perspective on justification for war. Now, first of all, before we get into this, let me get something out of the way. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 7. I want to get um, something out of the way here before we begin this study on, on the biblical justification for war. I want to get something out of the way that a lot of people um, confuse, in my opinion. And that is the Old Testament wars that we read. Okay, In Deuteronomy chapter 7, I'm going to read for you the first three verses of Deuteronomy chapter 7. So Old Testament wars, there are some things that we need to realize about the Old Testament wars uh, regarding the nation of Israel that we need to understand before we begin this study this morning. Look at verse number 1 of Deuteronomy chapter 7. The Bible says, when, thy Lord, that when the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land, he's talking to the nation of Israel that's going to go and possess the promised land, whither thou goest to possess it, and cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Parasites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, seven nations greater, greater and mightier than thou. God is saying that you're going to go possess this land that these seven nations already have. And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, that means the Lord thy God is going to give them the victory over these nations. Thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. They were to completely destroy all these seven nations. Look at verse number three. Neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter shall thou not give unto his son, and nor his daughter shall thou take unto thy son. What I want to get out of the way here this morning is that this situation where God gave this land to the nation of Israel and then God fought for the nation of Israel to push these people out of this land is a unique situation. It does not apply to any situation in modern history. This is the only time in the history of the world that God has literally given land to... I mean, He gave it to the specific tribes. He gave it to the specific families went through all of this in Joshua, in our study of Joshua. The point is, God literally gave them this land and possession of this land also, by the way, when you think about, well, what about Israel today? It doesn't apply today. Because as they turn from the Lord, that, the, their covenant, the, the covenant with the nation of Israel was always, always conditional on obedience. And that's a whole study in itself. But all that to say this, no one has this, God gave me permission, as the Israelites did. Okay? The land and the declaration of war on these nations was a special case in the Bible. So you say, what about today? Well, the Bible gives us the answer on what is going on today. So all that to say that the, the land in the Old Testament, the wars in the Old Testament, the Lord fighting for you know that specific land for those specific people, that was just for that time, and it was conditional, and that, those conditions have been broken thousands of years ago. Okay, Now, let's talk about this. Go back to James chapter 4, and let's look at, you know, what is a time for war? Go to James chapter 4. What is a time for, to, for war? In order to understand what a just cause or a just time for war is, we need to look at the root cause of war. And that's what James chapter 4 is going to give us. It's going to give us the root cause. Whenever you want to solve a problem, you know, first of all, you have to find the root cause of that problem. If there's some you know, big engineering failure or some disaster or something like this, we need to, in order to fix it, in order to understand how to solve it, we need to find out what was the base cause what, was the, what we call in, in the scientific world, the engineering world, what was the root cause of the problem? Look at James chapter 4. James chapter 4 gives us the root cause of war right here. And look at verse number 1. The Bible says, from whence come? Where, where, where come wars? It's saying, from where? From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of the lusts that war in your members. That is the key verse right there. Verse number two, it says, Ye lust, and ye have not. Ye kill, and desire to have, 
and cannot obtain. Ye fight in war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. So we see here that there's a word used many times here, which is just this, this lust. And lust is desiring something, and explains to us, it's desiring something that we do not have, or that is not ours. So look, the Bible here is saying is that war is started for this reason of lusting. Of lusting. Desiring to have. Desiring to obtain something that is not currently yours. Or that maybe you think is yours, and somebody else disagrees with you that it's yours. I mean, you think about this. Turn to Amos chapter 1. In the Minor Prophets, and towards the back of the Old Testament, look at Amos chapter 1. So what are, the, what are some things that, that nations could lust after? Or even people that lust after? Because it compares, in verse number 1, it compares the morality of nations, and this is super important that you get this, to the war, the lust that you have in your members. So what it is saying is, the current lust that I have as a person... You know, my flesh, my desires for things, things I see, hear, things I want personally. This is the same reason that nations lust after things. Is the morality, the, the, the sinful flesh of the individual, you know, it carries through to the lust of nations. Look at Amos chapter 1. What are some things that nations or even people could lust after, desire after, be covetous towards? Look at Amos chapter 1. The first one is just in land. Just, just property, right? What the Bible calls enlarging your borders. Look at Amos chapter 1 and verse 13. The Bible teaches that God judges nations for this. Thus saith the Lord, Amos chapter 1 and verse 13. For three transgressions of the children of Ammon, not a godly nation, by the way, and for four I will turn not away the punishment thereof, ripped up the women with child of Gilead, that they might enlarge their border. Here, this, one of the reasons that God was going to judge this nation was because they went and they, they killed innocent people to enlarge their borders. That's what the Bible says. They made war on innocent people just to take land that was not currently theirs. All right, look at, you know, what are some other things that you could lust after? I mean, it could not just be just land. It could be resources, minerals, energy, water, oil. All these things are things that people, that nations can lust after. Power, think about this, just power, control, ports, infrastructure, strategic interest, etc. And then the, the final one that, that nations can lust after, that people can lust after, that they've been lusting after since the beginning of time is this commodity of people themselves. Think about that. Think about what a dictator does. He's, he's coveting people. He's lusting after people, taking control of people. This is what the Bible is saying is, is the cause of war. It's just this lust after these things that are not belonging to you. Now, now that we know the, the unjust reason, the sin that causes war, we can go ahead and we can, we can find out what a just reason would be for fighting a war. Turn to Exodus chapter 22. Exodus chapter 22. Basically, defending against somebody that is lusting against things, as in James chapter 4, would be a just reason for war. Basically, defending against the sins that we just talked about. The Bible does. Now, this is a whole sermon in itself, but the Bible clearly is in favor of self-defense. The Bible is, it, it clearly teaches that it is okay to defend oneself. Look at Exodus chapter 22 and look at verse number 2. Exodus chapter 22 is, is talking in, in these few verses here. It's talking about, you know, reasons that, reasons that you, could, you could use lethal force to defend yourself. Okay, and it's talking about a thief in verse number 2. It says, if a thief be found breaking up and be smitten that he die, there shall no blood be shed for him. So the Bible here is, if you read the next couple verses, and I'm not going to get into this study in detail, it's a whole sermon in itself, but basically it's talking about if a thief comes into your house at night and you don't know why he's there or whatever, and it's like, and if, and if, and if you kill him, that there's, 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 it's just, is what the Bible is saying here. 
It's saying, you know, in later verses, it says if it's during the daytime and you see that he's just stealing, you know, you shouldn't kill someone just over property if it's in the daytime. But if somebody breaks in at night, you don't know what they're doing there. You know, they, they come in, it's, it's okay in that case, according to the Bible, to use lethal force. So the Bible clearly, all that to say this, go back to James chapter 4, all that to say this, the Bible clearly lays out a right to self-defense. And it makes perfect sense because if you look at James chapter 4 and verse number 1 especially, that people come hence, even if you're lost at war in your members, people that want things and they're going to come and they're going to literally kill, it says in James 4. They're going to kill to take those things. It makes perfect sense that the Bible would also justify defending against that. Okay? So, look, the wars, but look at James chapter 4 and verse number 1. You need to understand this. The wars amongst nations. It is the same problem with sin amongst nations individuals. Look at the verse number one. It says, from where come, whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of the lusts that war in your members. Here it is, is comparing war of a nation to the same lust that we have as individual people. The morality of the individual can be applied to the nation. And so let's look at this idea of self-defense. And let me show you how, you know, you know, how this could be gray when it comes to nations. I'm going to have a little object lesson. I'm going to ask Garrett to come up here. And we're going to, I brought some guns with me to church today. And I'm going to give Garrett a gun. And what we're going to do is we are, Garrett is going to, like, you're going to think about this as an individual and think about this as also a nation. So here we have, and I want you to think of individual morality, as I just showed you from the Bible, and I want you to think of the morality of a nation. So here we have the nation of Garrett, okay? And here we have the nation of Pastor. You're right, it, it sounds better. My nation sounds better already, right? Now, the nation of Garrett, and if you could step a little bit closer, the nation of Garrett and the nation of Pastor, we both, sorry, right here, my microphone cables, but the nation of Garrett and the nation of Pastor, we both have guns, and that's okay, because the nation of Garrett, Garrett has, an, has a right in the Bible to defend himself, also the nation of Pastor has a right to defend himself. However, you can see what we would have a morality problem if the nation of Pastor looked at the nation of Garrett and you're just like, man, that guy's got a gun, what in the world? Or, you know what I mean? Now, would that work in the court of law as far as an individual basis goes? I don't think so. Obviously, I would be in a lot of trouble if I just saw somebody who had the right to have a gun and I just shot them because they had a gun, right? That would not be correct. Now, here's where things could get a little bit gray. Now, let's say that we're, I'm the nation of pastor, we have the nation of Garrett. We both have guns. We both have a biblical right to self-defense. It's okay that we have guns, but let's say Garrett takes his gun out of his pocket and just hang, he, he cocks it and he hangs it by his side. Now I'm like, hey man, what are you doing, buddy? You know, would I still be justified in, you know, I don't know what you're doing, but in attacking Garrett because he has a gun and he took it out of his pocket? Probably not. You know, with modern self-defense laws in most countries, especially the United States, there has to be a, what they call a critical or a, a credible, a reasonable, a reasonable fear of an imminent, imminent threat to your life, okay? So I would probably still be in trouble individually morality, morality wise, according to the Bible, according to laws of the land, if just because Garrett took the gun out of his pocket, I shot him, right? But now let's just take it a step further. Let's say that the nation of Garrett and the nation of Pastor still sounds better. We both have guns, but now let's say that the nation of Garrett loads his gun and points it at my forehead. Now I'm in trouble. Right? Because now, even if I wanted to defend myself, I couldn't. There's no way that I could possibly defend myself. He's clearly threatening me. There's no way that I could possibly defend myself before. 
See, he's, his wasn't loaded on purpose. But so the morality, this is the gray area I'm trying to get you. The morality is somewhere between Garrett raising his gun towards me where I suddenly have a, a reasonable, moral, imminent danger to my life, if that makes sense. So thank you. All right. So the point is there's some gray area when it comes to self defense, especially amongst nations. And anybody who's ever gone out and got a concealed carry license and carries a gun, they understand that like, they better understand exactly where that point of that arm raising is, or they're going to, they're possibly going to end up in jail for the rest of their life. So the point is like nations are a little bit looser with these rules and are a little bit looser with these things. Also, let me talk about this. Turn to 1 Samuel chapter 30. We also looked at, so there's a right to self-defense. We see that. So nations have a right to self-defense just as the moral principles of individuals have the right to self-defense. Now, let's talk about this. Let's talk about this lusting towards people or lusting after people because this is like, this is your dictatorships. This is your people that are oppressed in the world. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 30. Look, it's lust all the same. It's lust all the same, but it's for a human commodity. All right? And the Bible talks quite a bit about this. There's an example in 1 Samuel chapter 30 about a, a town that gets invaded and all the people are stolen from the town. And some of those people, that the problem is that some of those people were David's family. And David was a man of war. Look at verse number 1 of 1 Samuel chapter 30. And it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag. They were gone. They were out. They were away. They were at war. On the third day that the Amicalites had invaded the south, and Ziklag had smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire, and had taken the women captives that were therein, and they slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away. They, they stole all the people here. Okay, They stole David's wives. They stole all the children. They stole everybody that was there. They didn't kill them. They took them all. So David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captives. And then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives were taken captives, Anna Noam, the, the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him, because of all the soul of the people was grieved for every man and his sons for his daughters. And David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. And David said to Abiathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, I pray, bring me the, hither the ephod. And Abiathar brought thither the ephod to David. And David inquired of the Lord. So now we're going to get the Lord's view on this. We're going to get the Lord's view on what he thinks about these people being stolen. Saying, shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him. He said, pursue. For thou shalt surely overtake them and without, without fail recover all. The Lord tells him, go to war against these people. And get these innocent people back. Okay, look at verse 17. And David does this. And it says, And David smote them. He defeated them. He fought them from twilight even unto the evening of the next day. And there escaped not a man of them, save 400 young men, which rode upon camels and fled. And David recovered all, just like the Lord said he would, that the Amicalites carried away, and David rescued his two wives. And there was nothing lacking to them, neither small or great, neither sons nor daughters, neither spoiled nor anything that they had taken from them. David recovered all. Look. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 34. God does not like people enslaved. God does not like people enslaved. In the Old Testament, in the Bible, it says men stealing. There's a huge misunderstanding about biblical servitude and actual slavery, or what the Bible calls as men stealing. Men stealing is punishable by death. And there's many examples in the Bible of people being enslaved unjustly that God is going to bring his wrath upon. Look at Jeremiah chapter 34. Jeremiah chapter 34, we're going to look at verse number 12. Jeremiah chapter 34. Jeremiah was prophesying against the coming Babylonian invasion of the kingdom of Judah, the lower kingdom of Judah. And look, there was many things that they were, getting in, they were going to get uh, judged for, but one of those things was this. Look at verse number 12. Therefore the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Jeremiah 34, 12, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I made a covenant with your fathers in the day that I brought them forth out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondmen, saying, At the end of seven years let go every man his brother in Hebrew, 
which have been sold unto thee when he hath served thee six years, that thou shalt let him go free from thee, but your fathers hearken not unto me, neither incline their ear. Let me just give you a quick biblical servitude example here. If you owed somebody money to declare bankruptcy, if I owe Brother Ryan $10,000, and this is Old Testament, and he's of the children of Israel, and I'm of the children of Israel, I don't get to just say, hey, declare bankruptcy, buddy. Have a nice day. I have to work for him. I, my labor is still worth something. And that's what Old Testament servitude was about. But there was rules. There was rules. There was rules on how servants were treated. There was rules on how long they could be kept. The Bible is saying that Brother Ryan, I, I could be a servant for six years, but on the seventh year he has to let me go. And then my debt is paid. That's the bankruptcy of the Old Testament. That's why, by the way, if you declare bankruptcy, your credit is bad for what? Seven years. It's biblical. It's, not, it's, it's from the Bible. It's not biblical what's happening today. But the point is, is we have just totally dismissed the value of a man's labor today. Because it is more fair if I owe somebody money, and, and I have nothing. I have a t-shirt and a pair of shoes. Maybe I don't even have shoes. I still have the ability to work. I still have my labor. That's what Old Testament servitude was. Now what these people were doing in Judah was they were just keeping their servants. They were, not, they were not letting them go. And you know what that's called? That's called men stealing. They were stealing those people's labor. They were just oppressing these people that were servants, and they were just not letting them go. Look at verse uh, 15. Let, look at verse 15. It said, well, verse 14. It says, at the end of seven years, let every bond, every go his brother in Hebrew which had been sold unto thee, and he hath served thee six years, thou shalt let him go from thee. But your fathers hearkened not unto me, neither inclined their ear. Verse 15. And ye were now turned and had done right in my sight in proclaiming liberty, every man to his neighbor. And ye had made a covenant before me in the house, which is called my name. But ye turned and polluted my name and caused every man his servant and every man his handmaid, whom ye had set at liberty at their pleasure, to return and brought them into subjection to be unto you servants and for handmaids. They just kept them. They kept them and that became, you know, slavery is what that became. That became the slavery of what we used to have in America, in early America. Therefore, thus saith the Lord. So what does God think about that? Does he just tell them, just like, hey, bad for you, naughty? No, he says, therefore saith the Lord, you have not hearkened to me in proclaiming liberty, everyone to his brother, and every man to his neighbor. Behold, I proclaim a liberty for you. A liberty, saith the Lord, for you. To the sword, to the pestilence, and to the famine. And I will make you to be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth. God says, for stealing these men and these women, he's like, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> That's what God thinks of slavery. That's what God thinks of stealing men. That's what God thinks of oppressing people unjustly. They were just keeping them. They were stealing them, and they were stealing their labor. They were lusting. Why, why, why would they do that? Can you imagine? Imagine how better your business would do if you could just bring in like 10 new people and you had to pay them nothing. I think the bottom line would do a lot better. Look, they were lusting. They were lusting after material. They were lusting after labor. They were lusting after money. They were lusting after people's lives is what they were doing. And God said, for that, you're going to get the sword. It's like, I'm bringing the sword to you. This is the dictator. This is the king today. This is Stalin's gulag camps. This is how Stalin built Russia. He just had all this forced labor, and he built the railroads, and he built the infrastructure of the country using forced labor. He was stealing men. That's what he was doing. This is the dictator. This is the king. This is the unchecked power. Back to war. Back to war. So you can lust after men just as you can lust after land and lust after resources. The Bible is very clear that God does not like this. Land, power, resources, money, people, it's all the same. It is sin. It is lust. So defending against this lust is a just war. So all war is caused by lust. It's very simple in the Bible. It's caused by lust. It's caused by covetousness. Defending against this is 
just. It's self-defense. And look, it's not a shirt off your back situation in war. Because when somebody comes to, you know, take, you know, what do they do in James chapter 4? They kill. They lust and they kill. So it's not like somebody in a war is marching and just saying, hey, you know, we're going to take the country. No, they kill people. They kill people for it. In a war, they will literally kill you for these items that we just talked about. So, it's simple, really. It's simple. The bad guy, we all want to think about we're Americans. We all want to think about black hats and white hats. We're going to get into that next. But the bad guy in war, the Bible says, is the guy that is covetous. And the good guy is the guy that is in self-defense. That's the good guys versus the bad guys. Now, everyone should agree. It's very simple, right? Everyone should agree on every single war, every single conflict, every Christian, or even a person that has any morality that's close to the Bible should agree on every conflict, right? But that's not the case. Why? Let's talk about propaganda. Let's talk about propaganda. Here's the problem. Here's the problem with war. Rarely, probably never, in war does someone go to war and say, Brother Matt, the nation... I." Nation of pastor is going against the nation of Brother Matt because I want your stuff. That is not why it happens. Instead, you have something called propaganda. This control of information, this to convince their people, their soldiers, their country, the world, everybody else, that their cause is just. That they are the one that is defending themselves. This is what every single nation does every single time. Okay? They are trying to get people to understand that or identify with them even if they are just lusting after resources and lusting after land and lusting after people. They're trying to use propaganda and spin and all these things to get everyone to realize that it is them that is the one in self-defense mode. It is them that is the one in just mode. Look, Hitler did this. Hitler did this. He wrote a book in 1925 called Mein Kampf. You know what Mein Kampf means? It means my struggle. He's trying to get people to feel sorry for him. He's trying to get people to realize he's the victim. You know, I'm the victim here. My struggle. How are you going to solve your struggle? How am I going to solve the struggle of my people? Well, you know, we know the story. But it is the same thing every time. The purpose of propaganda is to convince people that the war is just, even if they were the one that started it. Amen. Even if they are the one that is lusting after that. And they use this gray area of self-defense that I tried to demonstrate do you hear? I mean, look, here's a, remember the gun exercise. Let's do the gun exercise one more time. Here's another thing that they can do. Remembering our gun exercise. Here's another, another uh, tactic that these people can use using propaganda, trying to get, I'm the nation of pastor, and I'm trying to get people to, to think that I am just in shooting Garrett. I just really want to shoot Garrett. That's my goal. I want to shoot him. So he's got his gun in his pocket, though. He's got his gun in his pocket. So what, like, what a lot of people will do in this case, since biblically I have no just right, biblically, morally, by anybody's morals, to just shoot him when he's got his gun in his pocket, what I'll do is I'll, t I'll say, hey, everybody, everybody, look over there. Kids, over there. And they'll be like, ah! He shot me! They shoot themselves in the leg. This is the false flag. You know, this is the false flag operation right here. Okay? But the purpose of the false flag operation that we've all heard about, and this is where, you know, we're not really sure. Who really knows what's true in many cases? You know, the purpose of that is to convince the people, the world, the nations, that they're the one that's in self-defense, not in lusting mode. Right? Everybody is trying, no matter who goes to war, no matter who starts a war, no matter who is in self-defense mode, everybody's trying to get everyone to think that they're the one in self-defense mode. That's, that's really the simplicity of it right there. The, the complicated issue of it is what's true and what's not. The Bible is not complicated. 
The information, this is why I'm not going into specific wars for you this morning. Because I mean, that's for conversations after church. Okay, but these concepts are the same for all of us. You know, I may differ with friends of mine on some of these specific instances. That's okay, because guess what? It's not our responsibility to know what's true and what's not for every lie that's told to us. We're just people. We're just people in these governments, these principalities, these powers. They tell so many lies that it's hard to tell. Look, I typically don't trust the government like at all. That's kind of where I'm from. I mean, that's just kind of my take on most things. But maybe some other people have different takes on it. But the point is, there's a lusting side that's bad. There's a self-defense side that's right. And you just got to try to figure out who's who in that. And if, and if we can't figure it out as people, that's not really our responsibility, right? Especially with wars that are going on somewhere else that have nothing to do with us. Turn to 1 Kings chapter 22. Well, what about, what about this idea? Who should we help? Who should we help? This is another thing that's, you know, a big question in people's minds today. Who should we help? What about, what about alliances? What about alliances? Look at 1 Kings chapter 22 and look at verse number 2. The Bible is very clear on this as well. The Bible is super clear on this, even though we don't really listen to this as a nation, but the Bible is very clear on this. Look at 1 Kings chapter 22. Here we have the northern kingdom of Israel. So the, the children of Israel have split. They have split into the northern kingdom and the lower kingdom, the northern kingdom of Israel and the lower kingdom of Judah. They have split. And we have this wicked king. Typically, you know, in general, the northern kingdom flew off the handle right away, turned on God right away. Judah kept, you know, more closer to the Lord than the northern kingdom. And they got judged, you know, 180 years later. So they lasted longer because they stayed closer to the Lord longer. But in this particular situation, we have a wicked king, Ahab, in the north, and we have a good king of the south, Jehoshaphat. Look at 1 Kings chapter 22 and verse number 2. And it came to pass in the third year that Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, came down to the king of Israel. And the king of Israel, this is Ahab, said unto his servants, Know ye not that Ramoth in Gilead is ours, and we be still, and take it not out of the hand of the king of Syria. And he said unto Jehoshaphat, Will thou go with me to battle for Ramoth Gilead? And Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, I am as thou art, my people as thy people, my horses as with thy horses. So the story, turn to first, Second Chronicles chapter 19. Second Chronicles chapter 19. The story is this. Ahab is trying to get Jehoshaphat to go to war with him, to join forces with him, to be in alliance together and go to war against the king of Syria. And let me remind you that the king of Syria is wicked. Syria is wicked. They, they don't believe in the Lord at all. They never did. They believe in multiple gods. They're a heathen nation. So it's, it's true that it's a wicked opponent. Now we start to see all these different things. But the, the Lord's direction is very clear. And Jehoshaphat, the good king, says, yes, I'll go to war with you. Is there a prophet that we can add? And they have all these fake prophets. But this one prophet says, you shouldn't go. Says, you shouldn't go or you, Ahab, are going to die. And he does die. So they throw the prophet in prison, of course. But look at 2 Chronicles chapter 19. So the battle happens. They go and they shouldn't go. And Ahab dies. And Jehoshaphat almost dies. He almost loses his life in this battle against this wicked nation. And look at 2 Chronicles chapter 19 and verse number 2. This is a super important verse right now. And this should be circled in your Bible. And Jehu, the son of Hanani, the seer, went out to meet him. He's talking to Jehoshaphat and said to the king Jehoshaphat, Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Look, he's talking about Ahab. He's not talking about Syria. Notice how Ahab was a wicked man fighting against a wicked nation, Syria. Jehu does not even bring up how wicked Syria is. All he tells Jehoshaphat is, you should not be helping somebody who hates the Lord. That's, what he, that, that's it. And he says, why? Therefore, wrath is upon thee from the Lord, from before the Lord. So he says, because you helped Ahab. It didn't matter how wicked Syria was. Wicked Syria was a wicked nation. It did not matter. It says, because you helped somebody that was ungodly, wrath is now on you from the Lord. So we should ask ourselves in this country, are these allies that we have in our country, are, are they godly? 
Are these allies godly? Should we help them? Maybe we should ask ourselves if we're godly. More gray area. We'll talk about that later. Look at Proverbs chapter 24 and verse number 6. So, I mean, it's pretty simple. Don't ally yourself with ungodly people. That's pretty clear in the Bible. I don't care what you think about what situation, that is clear as day in the Bible. Look at Proverbs chapter 24 and verse number 6. So there's some principles I'm trying to give you here this morning that you should be able to apply to the situations that you see happening in the world. Look at Proverbs 24, 6. The Bible says, For by wise counsel shall thou make war. If you're allied with a bunch of people who are ungodly, that by definition is unwise. And in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. Wise counsel is biblical counsel. Wise counsel is counsel that is based in the word of God. Proverbs 20, 18, I'll just read for you. It says, every purpose is established by counsel and with good advice make war. Good advice is this advice right here. The problem with alliances, especially with alliances with ungodly nations, is they drag countries into wars. They drag countries into wars. And this has been a major philosophical shift in this country in the last 70 years or so, especially. Alliances with the ungodly, though, folks, have always been bad. So the Bible here is saying, so what, do we, what have we learned? War is caused by someone lusting after somebody else. Just war is defending against that lust. Propaganda muddies the waters. Propaganda muddies the waters. However, alliances today are bad, because I don't see any godly nations out there, including our own. But let's talk about our country. Look, it didn't always used to be this way. Let me take you back to 1796. Let me take you back to 1796, and let me quote from George Washington's farewell address. This was called, and it was known, it was known for hundreds of years as the great rule. The great rule. Washington's farewell address in 1796. Listen to this. The great rule, this is George Washington, the great rule of conduct for us in regard to foreign nations is in extending our commercial relations to have with them as little political connection as possible. So far as we have already formed engagements, let them be fulfilled with perfect faith. Here, let us stop. So you know what he's seeing? He was already seeing this happen. He was already seeing this happen because he said, I know we've made some deals already. Let's fulfill those and be honorable in those deals that we've already made that we shouldn't have made. But then let's please stop, he says. Washington, um, Alexander Hamilton also agreed. He says, they both said, interweaving our destiny with others. Washington and Hamilton both agreed that it would entangle our peace and prosperity in the toils of European ambition, rivalship, interest, humor, and caprice. It just, it would tangle us up in their interest. Caprice means like this, just like you just suddenly turn on somebody. That just like, why would we want to be involved with France that suddenly turns on Germany, or Germany that suddenly turns on somebody else. Why would that even, we want to be tied up with that? John Quincy Adams reiterated this principle in 1821 when he reminded Congress that America goes not abroad. This is a quote. America goes not abroad in search of monsters to destroy. I, I really like John Quincy Adams. She is the well-wisher to the freedom and independence of all. Well-wisher. She is the champion and vindicator only of her own. So as far as freedom, as far as independence, we're like, we wish you well. We hope that you see us and you, you follow our example, look at our independence, look at our freedom, but she is the champion and vindicator only of her own. Boy, have we strayed from this. After World War II, the shift from American defense, as we saw this great rule, it turned into defending American interests into something that is called, if you've ever heard of it, the Truman Doctrine. In the Truman Doctrine, let me just read you a quote. It says, at the start of the Cold War, President Harry Truman, he proposed a new great rule to replace the old. Like Washington, Truman had public opinion on his hands. He had public opinion behind him. Following a vigorous debate, the US Congress accepted Truman's contention that it was imperative to support free peoples who are resisting attempted subjugation by armed minorities or by outside pressures. This was communism. This was communism that was coming in to the world. This is where we got Korea. This is 
where we got Vietnam. This is where we got all these struggles against communism. It was this, look, it was this Manichaean thought of good versus evil. You know what? And it kind of worked. It kind of worked with communism because this was a terrible evil in the world at that time. So it was, the citizens agreed that it was the United States' job to defend the so-called free world alone and to go it alone if necessary. This was the Truman Doctrine. The Truman Doctrine meant global military assistance on a scale never before seen. And since 1947, as America, America has fought more foreign wars than any other nations. This course is a course preferred by the establishment, Democrats and Republicans, arguing that change will result, that changing this doctrine will result in, result in chaos. Have you ever heard this before? That is, if America, and, and maybe that is partially true at this point, as America would pull back from the world, it would result in chaos. That's why we have you know, soldiers and, and military in 80 countries across the world. It's because of the Truman Doctrine. That's why every foreign war that we engage in is sold to us that we're freeing other people, folks. It's this doctrine right here. It's the Truman Doctrine. So we fight overseas and invade to free. That's more propaganda. While we enslave ourselves at home is the problem. While our government literally lusts after its own people, and we lose more and more of our freedom. And then guess what? Especially as we walk away from the Lord at home. This country is walking away from the Lord. All that to say this. Let's go back to the Bible. Ultimately, in the Bible, remember, foreign alliances with the ungodly are always bad. It's the same philosophy of denominations with churches, folks. You know, as, as you know, we would just get in denominations with a bunch of churches, it would just drag us into, you know, fellowship with a bunch of immoral or amoral churches, and that, that would destroy our doctrines. That's a big no-no with churches, but it's a big no-no with nations as well. Turn to Isaiah chapter 31. Turn to Isaiah chapter 31. So we used to have, as this nation was founded, we used to have a a doctrine of foreign relations that was much closer to the Bible. Now, not so much. Look at Isaiah chapter 31. Isaiah chapter 31, and look at verse number 1. Why are we not, why? I mean, God even gives us the answer of why we're not to ally with ungodly nations in Isaiah 31. Look what he says. Look at verse number 1. Woe to them that go down to Egypt for help, and stay on horses and trust in the chariots because they are many, and in horsemen because they are very strong. But they look not unto the Holy One of Israel, neither seek the Lord. Yet he is also wise and, and will bring evil and will not call back his words, but will arise against the house of the evildoers and against the help of them that work iniquity. Now the Egyptians are men and not God, and their horses flesh and not spirit. When the Lord shall stretch out his hand, both he that helpeth shall fall, and he that is hoping shall fall down, and they shall all fa fail together. For thus hath the Lord spoken unto thee, like as a lion and the young lion roaring on his prey. When a multitude of shepherds is called forth against him, he will not be afraid of their voice, nor abase himself to the noise of them. So shall the Lord of hosts come down to fight for the Mount Zion and for the hill thereof. He's saying, he's saying don't trust in these godly nations. You should trust in the Lord, Amen. is what he's saying. And look, we don't trust in the Lord. Instead, we trust in alliances with ungodly nations. It's not going to work out. It's not going to work out for us. That's why, that's why these alliances that you see, they cause war. They don't prevent it. It's because we're, we are allying with ungodly nations as we walk away from God in this country. How in the world, as a Bible-believing Christian, do you think that's going to end well? It, it's not. So look, in conclusion this morning, it's a complicated topic, this topic of war. But to stay biblically, you must conclude, especially in a world that has lost moral authority, by the way. I mean, the Truman Doctrine was based on this good versus evil thought. I mean, just think about this for a second. It was based on this. I mean, China has Z, Russia has Putin, Canada has Trudeau. We have Biden. Can someone tell me who has the biblical moral authority today? This is why it's confusing. This is why you may look at it, and look, I am glad that we are still as free as we are. I am glad we are still as free as we are. I am glad that we still, at this point, have free course to preach the gospel. Because guess what? That is my war. But this country is hardly for the Lord. 
hardly for the Lord. My patriotism lies in preserving what is left of what we were given in this country. In preserving, maybe we could teach enough people the Bible where we could turn the tide on this. Maybe we could start enough Bible-believing churches where we could turn the tide in this country. Look, I am glad that our war can still continue in this country so we can get people saved. But the bottom line is we've taken a great gift and squandered it in this country is what we've done. We should, we're out here to persuade men and we need freedom to be able to do that. So how should a biblical country operate now, now that we know these rules? You can basically conclude that invasions are almost always wrong. Well, it's just one country lusting over the resources, the borders, the, you know, whatever. I mean, everyone kind of says, but you say, well, whose land is it? Well, we kind of have to decide, you know, it's kind of got to be, I don't know if you ever heard the, the French term, fait accompli. It basically means, like, the established order of things needs to be the way it is. Wherever there's a nation, a culture, a people, a border, that needs to be respected. They should be able to exist. If a, look, if, here's the thing. If a country wanted to be part of another country, there would be no war. It would just be an annexation. So whenever you have a war of a country going into another country, you know right there that it's lust, it's covetousness of some kind. And the Bible is not for that. Now you can go and apply this to our own country, and you're going to run into some problems. You're going to run into some, some conundrums in your mind. But look, you just got to stick with what the Bible says. All right? Because, look, if a country just wanted to be part of another country, as people convince you that that's what it is, there would be no war. War is always caused by covetousness. Let me just say a couple more things. And also, by the way, people throwing off tyranny, throwing off slavery to freedom is the equivalent of repelling a foreign invader trying to lust and covet a nation's resources. So if there's a dictator trying to covet us, you know, that's wrong too. That's the same Lust. This is what dictators do. They steal resources. And the resources are people. Let me give you two closing points. This sermon is to just give you some perspective on what the Bible says. Lust versus self-defense. It will never work th th this way. There will always be war. Until Jesus Christ is in a monarchy and he is controlling this world, there will always be war. And God will also, you know, nations are not following the Lord today, folks. And God will use nation to judge nation, and wars will exist. But as far as what is moral and what is not, we should always keep a biblical view. That's all I'm trying to get you to understand this morning. And, but here's another thing. You should always try to look at every side of every situation because of this propaganda thing. Even the Ukraine conflict. Even a conflict that seems very black and white. You should always look at both sides. It will give you a better idea. It will give you a recognition of you know, of propaganda and how it's used against you. Because guess what? Even in this conflict today, both sides are trying to silence the other. You could see propaganda on both sides of the situation. I mean, if you could go ahead and tell me when we visit after church today and we visit tonight, if someone could please tell me who in this world is for free speech today, I'd love to hear it. I mean, even in this country, there is certain speech that is just not allowed. I mean, we saw it during the pandemic. Certain, certain opinions are not allowed. The Bible is hate speech. You call out perversion for what it is in the Bible. That's hate speech today. Who's for free speech? Look at both sides of every issue though, as much as you possibly can. And the world is getting less and less easy to understand through the lens of good guys and bad guys. Because it doesn't seem like there's many good guys anymore. Don't let people put you into the box of false paradigms. That's another thing. Right versus left, Republican versus Democrat. Don't let people point the West versus the East. Don't let people put you into these, these rules, these, these boxes of false paradigms. This, this whole situation that we're going through with Russia and the Ukraine, it reminded me of a quote from, this is George, I remembered from the preface of Animal Farm. I'm going to read you something today. Animal Farm was written in 19, I think it was 1946. Something, I mean, World War II was underway. The Nazis were the Nazis, and we were allies with Stalin. Animal Farm is a critique of communism, is what it is. It is a, it is a critique of the evils 
of communism. The guy was our ally. But here's a false paradigm. George Orwell got a lot of flack for writing this book. Let me read you just a quick quote. that I, I went and I looked this up and he says, it became hard to write candidly of the Soviet system without being accused of playing dupe to the Nazis. He couldn't criticize Soviet Russia because people say, what do you love, Hitler? Same thing's happening today. If you criticize anything that's going on with the way we're reacting or anything, people are going, what do you love, Putin? No, wrong. Reject false paradigms. Because we're the Bible. That's what we are. We're not, we're not, hey, you know, you either love Zelensky or you either love Putin. No, we're the Bible. That's what we are. So this, oh, you either love Stalin or you love you love Hitler, that's a false paradigm. They're both some of the wickedest people that have ever lived. The propaganda is the X factor. Look at both sides. And don't fall into false paradigms. People will disagree. That's OK. As long as we agree on the Bible, that's the main thing. The reasons and that the powers and principalities go to war are sometimes hid very well. I mean, that's why they're in the positions that they are. Like I said, I tend to just not trust anything the government says. But maybe you're more trusting than me, or maybe you're less trusting than me. That's fine. We can just never really know the truth of these things. Look, I have all kinds of ideas on who killed JFK. I have all kinds of ideas on what happened on 9-11. But guess what? We're probably never really going to know the truth on those things. We will never know the full truth. How could we? How could we? All these invasions, false flags. Look, plenty of soldiers, plenty of good men have been duped into fighting for evil causes. That's a common thing. We should try to be as informed as possible. I always like, one of the best ways I like to be informed about things is to read the actual words that people from history actually wrote. Mein Kampf is a good one. That guy was nuts. He, he, it's just from his own writing. You know, he was nuts. He hated Jews and he wanted to, you know, he wanted to solve it in a very specific way from his own words. My wife and, and uh, kids are reading a, a book called The Nuremberg Diaries which is about the Nuremberg trials. And they actually interviewed a lot of these SS folks and the, the upper level Nazis. Look, they just came out and told you. They're just like, oh yeah, yeah, that's what we did. Here's what we did. Here's how we did it. You know, but look, there's never any way we could all know the truth of every historical situation. But the Bible is clear. War is lust and self-defense is just. That even rhymes. You can remember that. You know, finally, you know, basically, ultimately, I was thinking about this too, the saved prevail in any war. They're really the only people that prevail. Because when the just goes to war with the unjust, or the, the unjust goes to war with the just, there's innocent people that die. There's people that die on all sides. But really, it ends life on earth, and only one group ends up in eternity. So, you know, if you think about it that way, the saved are the only ones that win. And let me just... Let me just read for you a quote from the very first sentence of a book called War and the Racket by Brigadier General Smedley Butler. This man was a decorated war hero, and he wrote this book in the 20s, I believe, or the early 30s. He predicted World War II, and this is what he says, and this basically mirrors James chapter 4. He says, war is a racket. It always has been. It is possibly the oldest, easily the most profitable, surely the most vicious, is the only one international in scope, is the only one in which the profits are reckoned in dollars and the losses in lives. James chapter 4. War is lust. That's all it is. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.